Uh, because we have so many participants, I'm going to hand over immediately to our chair, uh, Dominic Mellon, who's lead consultant in health protection uh, at Public Health England in the Southwest. So, Dominic, I'll hand over to you to introduce your panellists. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, so, yeah, as Phil mentioned, I'm a lead consultant for, for Public Health England Southwest in health protection uh, and currently acting deputy director of health protection as well within the team. Um, I've been incident leader within the Southwest region since pretty much we started back in January time when the first reports were coming through of an undiagnosed uh, pneumonia from Wuhan and, uh, and not really looked back since. Um, so I, I won't go much more into, into my background, but I've got a panel of uh, extremely learned colleagues on here. So I'm going to ask each of them uh, to introduce themselves in a moment and I'll go around uh, and ask each of you just to say uh, who you are, the organization that you work for. Um, and then if you could possibly just tell everybody who's online at the moment, uh, what you think are the current and unresolved issues with regards to testing and how you think the science can help to address those. Uh, and then we'll get stuck into some of the questions then, please. So can I start with John Deeks? Hi, I'm John Deeks. I'm a professor of biostatistics at the um, University of Birmingham and lead a test evaluation research group there. I'm also the BMJ's chief statistical advisor. Um, I've been working in evaluating medical tests for the past 20 years, both designing studies, um, reviewing studies, and also working on the methods to try and see how we can best learn whether tests do more good than harm. It was a quiet backwater of research to be in. Um, no journalist knew my telephone number, but that's all changed with the pandemic. <clears throat> During the pandemic, I've seen that we've been bombarded with um, lots of information about tests which seriously has tested the statistical literacy of ourselves and our leaders and our media. I spend probably an hour every day on the phone to a journalist somewhere teaching them about how to understand whether a test is a good test or a bad test. A lot of the information we're being given out is given out with high certainty and it often is inappropriate. And a lot of what I'm trying to do and have been doing is to try and ask that question about how do we know whether this is true? Something that <clears throat> the, my predecessor in Doug Altman taught us all at the BMJ uh, to look at with every paper. And it's quite tricky with some aspects of tests, but there are three questions which I see we get a long way in trying to sort out where knowns are really unknowns. And they're asking the questions of, is this test being delivered in the way in which it will be used in practice? Um, if it's been uh, delivered on the wrong samples or by laboratory technicians, when it's going to be a test delivered by trained non-healthcare professionals, that can make a big difference. Second question is uh, as to whether or not the people it's being tested on are the right people. We have a lot of testing of asymptomatic people in the country at the moment. We have very few studies showing how well tests work in asymptomatic people. And the third is whether or not it's going to actually detect what we want it to detect. Has the study got a reference standard in it which actually looks at the right thing? So if we want to know whether we can use an antibody test to look at surveillance for disease spread, only seeing how well it can actually detect antibodies doesn't answer the whole question. So I've spent a lot of time um, thinking about um, looking at statements and trying to separate them into ones which are hopes uh, and ones which are facts but also importantly, uh, look out and point out for the omissions of information that we haven't been told. Um, I think our, our regulatory system is behind a lot of the problems that we're facing in here. The CEIVD mark is a very easy mark to get. Um, it, there are, have been 10 times as many tests we've seen get um, approved for antibodies and antigens than you see in the FDA lists and other organizational lists because you don't need to show that a test works in its intended role very clearly to get an IVD mark, a CEIVD mark, whereas you do for other organizations. So I think a lot of what we're looking at with tests is this gap between the evidence which has been produced, which is often only on analytical uh, properties of a test, and the need to be very clear as to what its intended use is and make sure that's what we see. Thank Thanks, you. John. Um, appreciate there's a number of issues there, and I think we'll probably hear very similar issues as we come through. So I'll collate those themes and we can start to address those as questions as we've gone around the introductions. Can I come to Angela next, please? Thank you, Dominic. Hi, everyone. So 
I've worked in screening since 1984 when I was doing my public health training. I took charge of trying to sort out cervical screening in the Bristol area. Gradually realized that in the 1980s, the screening we were doing with the exception of newborn was a chaotic, expensive, harmful mess. Realizing very few of the benefits that it could realize. Long story short, we, by 1996, we managed to set up the National Screening Committee and the UK National Screening Programs. And the aim of the National Screening Committee and the programs was to say, let's not get in a mess again. We'll take careful, measured, evidence-based decisions about whether a screening program is the right thing to do. And if it is the right thing to do, we will introduce it really, really carefully with clear service specifications, quality standards for every step of the pathway, good information for participants, we have 11 national screening programs, screening for 36 conditions, publishing their quality uh, measures regularly. The tests we do in screening programs, it takes such care to make sure that the test is actually measuring what you want, that you've got a clear case definition, that the sample takers are all properly trained, that they retrain frequently, that they do proficiency tests and all the labs do quality assurance and that there is a really good pathway so that you screen the people you want to screen, you support them through the process, they get a load of information that's relevant with their result and whatever action needs to happen, happens. And if it doesn't happen, you make it happen. Um, in, then we wrote the book about screening, um, strongly recommend it. Chapter one, great bedtime reading, the history of screening the last hundred years and everything we've learned. I'd moved to the food and farming sector, though still doing my teaching for the national screening programs um, and wasn't at all involved in the COVID debate until June um, when the BMJ said, can you write something please? Because there's a lot of really messy talk by people with no experience of screening programs of doing lots and lots of testing on symptomless people not the kind of routine target to testing that we do in communicable disease control to trace for contacts, but wider than that. And we need to be sure we do it well. Since then, I've become increasingly worried and I'm really glad that Peter talked about the politicization of science. So I now know more about the government's decision-making process on what's called moonshot than I ever thought I would. It has been dreamt up um, by Dominic Cummings, the way that the senior um, politicians approached it was to have a call to arms meeting with all the test manufacturers. They said to the National Screening Committee, no, 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 we're going to test the whole of the society, but we don't need your advice or input at all. Uh, they've bought the tests, they're doing it, they're rolling it out. And it's very difficult for everybody that gets told they've got to test. Um, there isn't training for the staff, there isn't infrastructure, there isn't a system around it. If you want to know more about why I'm worried, there is a personal view in the BMJ this week, and there will soon be on the Good Law Project website, an expert witness statement for a judicial review that's being brought against the decision-making process at government level. Thanks, Thank Angela. So I, I can see questions already around uh, risks and harms and thinking about the impacts of testing generally at a population level. Um, so I've no doubt we'll pick some of that up. Can I come on to Susan Hopkins then, please? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Hopkins. I'm a consultant a clinician working in infectious diseases and epidemiology for the last 25 or so years. Uh, I normally uh, focus a lot of my efforts on healthcare association infections, antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic use. Um, but for the last year, I have been working on the COVID response um, uh, initially as the incident director in Public Health England and more latterly as the strategic director in Public Health England and as a medical advisor to NHS Test and Trace. Uh, I'm very happy here to discuss the tests and the work that we've done in doing and going through the testing um, and my job has been to try and make sure that we get as much data as possible into the public domain um, uh, and we have pushed the PHE and portion down um, and Oxford University report out 
Uh, I'm working with Sue Hill to get the lab data validation that she led out as soon as possible. Um, uh, I, in terms of um, uh, population testing, um, I, I'm not going to comment on government decisions because that would make my role quite difficult, as people would imagine. Um, but I am very happy to focus and say that you know one of my focused efforts has been to increase the testing capacity so we can start testing contacts um, who are likely to be at much higher risk of disease. And we know from all of the studies that we've done that 20 to 30 percent of contacts subsequently go on to develop infection and that uh, getting their diagnosis rapidly um, could prevent secondary and tertiary transmissions. Uh, we're also really keen on testing in high risk workplaces where we know that transmission is occurring regularly um, and where particularly in an outbreak setting where we can use testing to try and stop outbreaks. Thanks, Susan. Um, so I'm going to move to uh, Ewan Burney then. Next, please. So, hi, I'm Ewan Burney. I'm Deputy Director General of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. This is an international treaty organisation. We're kind of sister organisation to CERN. We're headquartered in Heidelberg, Germany, and I co-direct um, one of our sites just south of Cambridge, the European Bioinformatics Institute. My background is genomes and genetics and computational biology. Um, my favorite genome uh, is uh, humans, um, but uh, we do everything from viruses up to humans, and therefore we are involved in the um, storage and sharing of viral genomes around the world, including uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, there's two additional things, or now an important additional thing to realize here for me is I'm a long established consultant to Oxford Nanopore, which is one of the companies that have made a new test around the LAMP uh, method called LAMPOR. And so that's a, quite a large conflict of interest here, but it's also given me a massive insight into watching a company develop a technology quickly and uh, push it through regulation in, uh, or get it through regulation in different places and get it deployed. Um, and in that test, one interesting aspect is not just being able to test for um, SARS-CoV-2, it's a bit like RT-PCR, you can also test for a multiviral panel at the same time. Um, but in fact, where I think I can contribute most is an understanding of some of the operational issues in actually trying to make some of these things work. So I know quite a few of the labs in different places that try to have tried to scale up successfully. I know them in the UK context and in the French context and the German context and the Italian context. Um, and so have some sense of how uh, this really quite complicated beast of people in labs and who you test and what happens next um, uh, works through. And one of the key things which I think we miss in some of this is we think that this is a PowerPoint or a pencil and paper exercise or a, or a committee strategy exercise. And a huge amount of the drama here is in really rather straightforward operations. And that's lab operations, but also this kind of um, end to end people flow operations. How do the people enter the system? What, why do they enter the system? what happens to the, the data and the test, and then what happens at the end. Um, and then that goes to a final point that testing by itself, I mean, I know this is blindingly obvious, but testing by itself is no solution. Um, uh, one has to do something uh, uh, at the end, and one has to think about what one does. It's not my expertise, but it is extremely easy for people to focus on the testing and testing capacity as if that's the only thing needed to solve some of these issues. My final little hobby horse is um, uh, metagenomic sequencing. So that's where you sequence samples directly or test samples directly without knowing precisely what's in them. One is lung lavages, and that's quite interesting and useful, maybe for the future. Uh, but the second one is wastewater. So sewage and wastewater and SARS-CoV-2 sheds incredibly early in its infection cycle, cycle through the gut. And that means that it turns up in sewage, not only does it turn up in sewage at some point, it turns up in sewage early uh, in the infection cycle. And that means that uh, wastewater testing is a great way to get, it's an orthogonal way to get surveillance on where transmission is happening in a country. And the great thing about that is that the participants, it's a passive process, 
you don't have to tell participants to do anything differently. Um, uh, you just attach your testing devices, as, as it were, your system to the right places in your wastewater scheme. Thanks, Ewan. So I think we've heard a bit about the different technologies that we've heard about operate, operationalization and the importance of implementation. Uh, and uh, as we're heading into the winter, the very important point about being able to test for multiple pathogens uh, when we're considering differential diagnoses as well. Um, let me come on to Caroline Relton, please. Thanks, Dominic. Um, I'm Caroline Relton. I'm a molecular epidemiologist at the University of, of Bristol, um, where I normally turn my attention to um, identifying biomarkers for the prediction and prognosis of disease. Um, I'm currently chairing our university scientific advisory group to help the uh, senior team with operational decision makings around our student body and, and, and safeguarding staff from COVID. Um, so that brings me into um, the forum of trying to translate the scientific evidence space into sort of operational decision making. Um, I'm also currently leading a, a study of, of testing of asymptomatic um, individuals in a large school based study. Um, across Bristol. So in terms of the discussion today, my primary interests lie in the use of asymptomatic testing for outbreak control um, in populations where asymptomatic infection is uh, believed to be uh, quite prevalent, so in particularly in children and young people. And as we know, testing provision has largely been confined to those showing no symptoms, sorry, showing symptoms at the moment, leaving quite large gaps in our knowledge about the understanding of transmissibility in asymptomatic individuals, along with other, um, other issues. So I'm interested to hear what the panel think about um, whether testing asymptomatic individuals um, will help us to contain and control the pandemic more effectively, and under what circumstances and, and context we might be able to, to roll that out. And this, of course, is, is set in the, the context of the, the very current challenge that's being faced by universities to roll out large scale mass testing for the student bodies um, in a window of a week in about 10 days time. Thanks, Dominic. Thanks, Caroline. And uh, I should add that I work very closely with Caroline and the team at the University of Bristol, both in terms of my uh, PhD role and also as a, as a senior lecturer there. Um, Margaret McCartney, please. Hello, thank, thanks so much for having me um, to, to come um, into, the, into the discussion today. Um, so I'm a general practitioner in Glasgow. I'm also a CSO um, career research fellow in Scotland. And I've written about screening and risk for a very long time in the broadcast and print media. Um, my biggest concerns have been um, poor information quality, a lack of sharing uncertainty, a lack of informing people about the pros and cons of interventions that they might be offered in medicine more generally. And I've been really alarmed at the way that we've gone about testing within the UK. So initially, when, when the tests were, were um, when people were allowed to order tests for themselves on the government website, questions were extremely binary and there was no clinical input. Um, either you had symptoms that were felt to be related to coronavirus or not. If you didn't have them, then you didn't get a test. No clinical input, no clinical oversight, just a very crude testing strategy. And then, of course, when people got back the results, it was either a yes or a no. There was no, um, there was no caveats put in there. There was no wording that might suggest to people that your test results might not be true and because of that I think we've done a great deal of harm not least in being effectively dishonest with the population we've still not got it right in terms of risk stratification or clinical input and I've had a long correspondence with the health select committee which you can find on their website about false negative testing and you'll see that um, Dido Harding feels that this is not an issue because if you test negative and you're thought to be perhaps positive you will be retested in hospital but of course the vast majority of patients are not in hospital, they're within the community, which is where I work. And of course, as a GP who's worked across the COVID centres as well, I very much see um, how people interpret and use the results that they've got. And the problem is that we simply do not know how people interpret and, and, and use the results that they get, except in the small amount of the work that's been done so far, which leads into my bigger rant about the lack of effective, um, effective testing of non-drug interventions, which we, we were subjecting millions of people to, and yet we're really lacking how 
high quality information about what the best way to do things are. So we know that data so far is telling us that a minority of people who have a positive test manage to isolate. Why are we not doing more to try and find out why that is? Is it not the case perhaps that local public health departments delivering that information might be better to able to help people to understand how, what to do and also to resource them to be able to do it? Do we understand what a negative test means for people? Do we understand the impact on behaviour and choices that people might make? Do we know that that's a good thing or a bad thing or is it perhaps a mixture that, that we might have to discuss with our individual patients to um, to give them helpful advice about what they might or might not want to do about that um, and again I, I don't believe that we really do know the effect of um, negative test or the effect of false negative testing rate as it happens in the community which is of course where the vast majority of people are and uh, again that's a population that I'm trying to, to look after. I feel as though um, general practitioners have not been used or helped effectively to be part of this response. It's been um, our COVID patients have been treated separately um, from our non-COVID patients, some of which has been, all of which has been well attended and some of which has been useful. But I think it's becoming much more difficult now when we have patients with um, multiple morbidities and trying to help them manage well um, within the, the, this, this pandemic. On a broader note, um, I've been really distressed to see how much tribalism has emerged within um, within the medical profession and um, the COVID pandemic more broadly. I think that there is room for middle grounds and lots of things. I think there is lots of areas that we could talk about more effectively. Um, and I think the tribal nature of stuff just now is not helping anyone, not least people who are looking on. I believe it should be possible for doctors and healthcare professionals to say um, we don't know an awful lot more and to allow people and our populations to help us reduce that uncertainty. I'm also really um, worried that we are not looking at real life outcomes here and instead we are, we're treating trial situations as what might happen more broadly. We can't do that, it's not safe and um, people do things that we don't anticipate a lot of the time and we're, we're, um, we're really going to damage our population if we don't consider unintended consequences at every turn. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Margaret. And last by no means least, Raj Papal, please. Yes, thank you, Dominic. Um, I'm Emeritus Professor of Public Health at the University of Edinburgh now, and I have been teaching epidemiology within a public health perspective since 1985. So I've taught probably tens of thousands of people on how to do simple calculations of sensitivity, specificity, and predictive powers. I still get the numbers wrong myself quite regularly, but it's not that easy. And also about the evaluation of screening programs. I really got into this field because uh, I was thinking about the purposes of doing tests and I did contribute to our Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh um, document on why we test and I've also written a little bit about the pandemic in various places and one of the things I've been emphasizing is that for any test we must calculate sensitivity, specificity and predictive power so we can begin to see what's going on. We published a paper called Test, Test, Test about antibodies, but the paper had 12 tables which are applicable to any test. It's nothing to do with um, antibody testing. It just happened to be that was topical. And more recently, I've become involved in the issue around mass testing. Uh, I did publish an overview, a public health overview, the COVID-19 Zugzwang paper, and I gave the purposes of testing. And I must say, I thought it was a very comprehensive paper, but I did miss out mass testing. The paper was written in April. The idea of mass testing, a screening program for this had never occurred to me then. So it did take me by surprise. But just for interest, I did um, uh, calculate the numbers for the Slovakian experience. And I published them on the BMJ website as a rapid response uh, to the paper by Mike Gill. And uh, I thought I would just share the numbers. Um, in that typical setting where 1% of the population, the prevalence of infection is 1%, which is about right where the, pop, the, the infection is out of control, there will be 10,000 people expected to be positive. And of them, the, the test being used in Slovakia, as reported by the Prime Minister of Slovakia, which will be a very good uh, sensitivity, much higher than in reality in practice, there would be... Um, Three, let me just get this right, um, of the positives, sorry, excuse me. 348 people would test 
negative when they actually are positive. And in Slovakia, they will be given a certificate to say, get on with your normal lives. And I don't know what the consequences of that would be for the rest of the population. And um, there will be 3,168 people who would be said to be positive when they're not. So they would be uh, false positives. And they'll be told to do the usual isolating and quarantining unless a second test was done. So there are very big questions raised by this kind of mass testing. I, in my own work, I have put a very strong emphasis on the importance of testing for public health surveillance. For me, um, okay, you need tests for clinical purposes to make a diagnosis for if you've got a patient in front of you. But apart from that, the single most important of testing purpose of testing for me is public health surveillance, um, the measurement of the prevalence and incidence of the disease. Because we heard today, well, of course, we all know about the ONS's amazing work, but those results on the antibodies are probably the most important data we have in the country on this particular infection, because they're the data that give us an insight as to what's really going on. And that's a partial insight, because that number is almost certainly an underestimate, because we haven't done um, IgA antibodies, we haven't done IgM antibodies, and we haven't done T-cell responses, and we haven't done other tests that would indicate whether a person has or has, has not had the infection. So um, that's where I come from, as a, a straight down the line, public health background, a bit like Angela, and um, a heavy emphasis on putting the numbers out and sharing them in a way that the public and the politicians can understand. Thank you, Raj, and thank you to all the panel members for that uh, overview and introductions. I think what we've heard is we've heard about the science, we've heard about the development of the evidence, the evidence base that supports the development and rollout of technology and, and a variety of different platforms and, and technologies that can be used. We've also heard that testing in itself is not a public health intervention. There has to be a connection through. There has to be a thought about how do you apply the testing? What's the use case? Uh, what's the end point? What's the impact that you're trying to achieve? And do we know whether or not that's being achieved? And of course, there's issues then about rollouts, about implementation, about operationalization, uh, and how does that differ between different areas and groups as well? So there's a number of questions that have already started to come through just uh, on Zoom so far. Um, and one of the ones that I wanted to pick up first is really going on from that initial theme then about how testing, particularly around mass testing, uh, can be used in terms of interrupting transmission uh, and having an impact in terms of population-based uh, incidence overall. How do we know that that's going on? Uh, is it making a difference? Um, are we able to measure that? Uh, and then I'm going to come on afterwards to think about how does that balance in terms of uh, risks and harms. So Susan, can I come to you first of all, just in terms of that question of, of, of looking at mass testing in terms of uh, whole population rollouts or looking at specific use cases, uh, how we can evaluate it and what the uh, the endpoints are that we're looking to measure. So firstly, as I said already, I'm not going to talk about the government's um, discussion on mass testing, but let me give you some other points. So for the mass testing was first uh, um, muted in the academic journals by Julian Pito and Al, uh, I think as far back as April, um, uh, where they wrote, wrote an opinion piece to say that we should be testing whole towns as a, a piece that should go forward. Um, uh, and since then, the idea of mass testing in towns and, and in cities and in countries has taken some hold. As you, many of you know, China, a number of cities in China have done whole mass testing, um, both bilateral flow devices um, and by PCR and by pooled PCR. That's also happened in a number of other Asian countries where they've mass tested. Uh, and most recently, we've had the story from Slovakia. Um, the modeling data suggests that, it, and this is SPIRE modeling, so in, it, it suggests that if, they, if, you re, if you basically get more than 75% of people to test, so a very high number of people to test in a population, with the test that is above 65% sensitivity, then you will start to have an impact by finding cases in the population that you would otherwise not detect. Um, and if all of those, or nearly all of those, at least 80%, but ideally more than 90% of those cases isolated, and Margaret's already commented on that, and we can come back to that point, um, then that it does bring down the prevalence 
in the population of circulating cases. It's particularly important with this infection, where up to about one third seem to remain asymptomatic, and that's reflected in the ONS data as well. Um, another third um, have limited symptoms, and that's reflected in the fact that at the moment, testing is predominantly given for people with one of three main symptoms, um, and we can all discuss that further. Uh, and that everyone, or at least almost everyone, is infectious definitely the day before they develop one of the main symptoms, but probably a couple of days beforehand, which is why contact tracing goes back 48 hours from the time of symptom development or your test results. So that currently just measuring and testing people with symptoms, no matter what symptomology we pick, um, will always miss cases who are can potentially transmit in the community. There are case reports of asymptomatic transmission, uh, and there are populations where you you find an awful lot of cases very fast, so particularly in workplaces. So we've gone in to food manufacturing plants and by the time we found a couple of cases that have symptoms and who've reported symptoms to the employer and tested largely around it to try and find other cases, one third of cases, one third of the population in that food manufacturing plant are positive, suggesting widespread asymptomatic transmission in, in this healthy young people cohort. So it's very difficult to see with the population prevalence that we have at the moment and the ONS statistics that say on average 50,000 new people get infected every day that we are going to manage it with our strategies alone. But on the other hand, I think that there are uh, negatives to testing well people in populations. We can all talk about those. Uh, we will have false positives. Um, uh, and the false positives really depends on how well the test is performed, as well as the analytical specificity of the test. Um, and, and I think the only way to mitigate that in the UK population is to have a system where people who test um, uh, positive are either tested again with the same test, which will uh, improve your specificity measurements, or alternatively test it with a more specific test. And again, uh, PCR testing is probably the most specific test we have. And it's probably a little oversensitive if we want to look at transmission rather than somebody who has had the disease or is going to have the disease over a period of about two weeks. Thanks, Susan. So I'm conscious, uh, Caroline, that you're doing quite a bit of work at the moment in terms of uh, deployment of testing at scale. Um, that's much more targeted than within the wider population. I wonder if you wanted to comment on that, please. Yeah, I think, I mean, to me, it's somewhat frustrating, this sort of binary um, choice between testing only symptomatic individuals or testing everybody uh, in the entire population, uh, who, uh, including asymptomatic individuals. And I think there's, there's merit in identifying a number of contexts or scenarios where we could gain a lot of insight um, uh, about the transmission of, of um, the virus by, by targeting a specific subset of the population using a, um, an asymptomatic testing approach and, and students and school children just are just two examples um, of that. So, so I think um, with a sort of predefined um, rationale, uh, so trying to understand, for example, the transmission patterns uh, uh, through young people, one could deploy asymptomatic testing in a way that would be really fruitful. I know that that doesn't sort of, um, well, it, it could partly play into to a, a surveillance agenda, it, but it doesn't really fall under the umbrella of sort of ma mass testing just purely to identify cases. It, it has a sort of, uh, I, I guess, a, a, a deeper set of objectives. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, Ewan. Yes, I, I also think this binary um, uh, kind of mass testing or not mass testing is not a very good framing at all. It's really a risk group of this hidden asymptomatic um, the prevalence of asymptomatic uh, levels. Uh, imagine a world where symptoms were, everybody got symptoms. We would obviously ask all of those people to, to test at that point um, in that world, even if we didn't think they had a risk of disease to reduce transmission. But one of the extra things I think is integrating having a joint data view of where infection is high. And sometimes we can do that very locally um, and that goes to contact tracing, but sometimes we can do that in a more workplace setting way. And then this takes you to wastewater as well, which allows you to, to have a surveillance system that is fast enough that you can have a response to a much higher local transmission. And that has come together once or twice, and I hope it will come together uh, more often uh, in the future. Thank you.
Um, so while we stay just on the subject of sort of mass testing at a, a, a large scale level, uh, Angela, you mentioned before about you know, the importance of thinking and evaluating the screening programmes and the work of the NSC. Uh, and I just wonder whether or not you wanted to comment specifically on the application of testing at these sorts of scales in terms of consideration of the, the, the those balance of risks and harms and, and, and how you can effectively uh, evaluate and should, should we be looking at mass testing um, as a screening exercise? So I, I share Caroline and Ewan's concern that we shouldn't dichotomize this into if you're going to test asymptomatics, that means the whole of society. Um, and if you're not going to do that, you're only allowed to test in diagnostic circumstances. And communicable disease control always involves lots of tests in people where you're not doing it for diagnosis, you're doing it to protect others, you're, you're doing it to investigate an outbreak. And I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem um, seeing a, an actual proposal for testing the whole of society repeatedly at a cost of maybe three quarters of what the entire NHS costs, um, being rushed out without any scrutiny by people like John who, who serves the National Screening Committee on one of its expert groups. And all the people with so much practical know-how from decades of the UK actually doing large screening programmes, as well as any other country as large as us. So it's tragic for me to witness Liverpool taking us back to the 1980s, really. You know, the screening began in the 20th century because epidemiologists wanted the data. And then before people knew it in the USA, everybody was being tested frequently and often, not because anybody thought it was in their best interests when they introduced it, but it became then embedded in the culture. And it took an enormous turnaround really from 1968 with Wilson and Jungner um, and the Nuffield Provincial Hospitals just here to say, hang on a minute, there's a lot of collateral damage from the opportunity cost and there's a lot of unintended consequences and even the direct benefit that we want to realize isn't happening when you're not organizing it as a program and it feels like and then everybody was very evangelistic about screening they said oh but people are coming and we're finding positive so it must be working and the public love it of course the public love it because you find far more stuff than actually in this case is infectious so they think thank goodness we found that um and it's taken us so long to get to the stage we're in now. And when I see Liverpool as a city all rallying around, which I can quite understand why they do, but making very false claims about how, well, this shows we've stopped the transmission. We do not know. We do not know the work hasn't been done properly on paper by people who are used to delivering screening programs in a UK setting um, or in practice to work out, will we realize the intended benefits and will the costs and the unintended harms actually balance that out so we just don't know. Thanks Angela. I'm going to come on to a couple of questions in a moment about more targeted testing around specific groups and there's a number of questions from the audience around uh, testing of healthcare workers specifically but before I do was there anybody from the panel who just wanted to come back on what Angela said? Raj. I have, I have, a, I have a small concern and that is one of the things we're trying to do is reduce mixing and um, to have people crisscrossing cities uh, to get any kind of tests goes against that concept, that principle. And I'm worried about that. Um, but I can see that if we can bring out home test kits, which uh, were low cost and people had them in their homes and they met all, the whole family did a test once a week or something, I can see that working because I think the, the big problem we have here is the asymptomatics, uh, the asymptomatic people, plus the possibility that the transmission is not simply through droplets, but actually through fine aerosol. And these two things make controlling this pandemic nigh impossible through conventional methods. And I think a home testing regimen could work. I'm not the first person to suggest it. I've just pinched that idea from other people. Um, but that would work, whereas 
crisscrossing cities to get to some sort of testing center or wherever, or even queuing up, you could be doing more harm than good through that crisscrossing. And we have to evaluate it carefully. Thank you. So an important part about how do we know that? Um, I'm going to come to Margaret McCartney, and then I'm going to move on to those other questions as I said a moment ago. So Margaret, please. Yeah, I just wanted to come in to support Angela, basically. I've been writing about screening for 20, almost 22 years. And, and what astounds me is just how difficult it is for policymakers and for citizens to get their heads around it. It's difficult stuff and I think we should be thanking the UK National Screening Committee for really helping us understand this and for providing transparent ways where we can see the evidence and make high quality decisions on the, on the basis of that. I have this horrible feeling that we're losing our head a bit um, over COVID and testing and screening. We need to science our way out of this. When we don't know something we should be aiming to reduce uncertainty and to do high quality trials with ethics committee oversight and with data monitoring committees so that we know what we're doing. And I struggle to know why we should be testing people at lower risk when we're not helping people who we know test positive to isolate and we're not doing contact tracing properly. We need to sort this out with the basics first of all. If we don't get that right, we will get nothing else right because we'll produce more and more tests that we're still not using appropriately in order to limit the damage through COVID. Thank you. Susan, did I see your hand up there for a second? No, that's fine. Thank you. In which case, I'm, I'm going to take us then into that area of maybe the high risk uh, groups or at least thinking about targeted testing at scale uh, and how that can be used and, and and to get us to that point I'm going to ask John if you wanted to comment uh, in terms of the use of antigen testing uh, in, in a large-scale testing setting and then we'll have a, a discussion if that's okay around uh, the use in healthcare workers specifically. John. Yes yeah, so the antigen tests we've um, been learning about in the last few weeks uh, they've come on board very fast and I think it's important that we just take a um, a sense of what we actually know about these tests in terms of how well they work. And the two big concerns are how often they are positive in somebody. They are not going to be positive until somebody's viral load gets very high, and it's often not high for very long. So it's a reduced time period when any individual will be positive uh, with these tests. And they're not going to be high in everybody, viral loads. And there's a particular concern with asymptomatics that the data um, for the uh, Innova test that we have in the UK, we've only got data from 43 asymptomatics in the Public Health England uh, report. So we don't really have enough data to learn about it. Other similar tests have more data in asymptomatics, all of which shows that the sensitivity of the test can be 10 or 20% lower in, used in an asymptomatic testing than in, in, in symptomatics. The other issue thinking through to home testing is that the data from Porton Down and Oxford show very clearly that there's a big impact of who does the test on how well these tests work. That the sensitivity went down from 79% in lab professionals to 73% in trained NIHR research nurses to 58% in, in staff who are working at test and trace centers who aren't healthcare trained. So um, we've got a lot of work to do with these tests. And I think it's important that we just take the time to say, this probably isn't gonna be the right test at the moment. And it's maybe that we're waiting for better tests, better technologies uh, to come through on, on for this before we're at the point of actually being able to do things safely. A large amount of this leads through to this idea of how we tell people what the results are. Because a negative test, when you've got a test which may only be 50% sensitive, is saying your risk is half of what it was before. You don't actually need to do Bayes' theorem because the risk is so low, you can just divide it by it. And so we shouldn't be telling people you're negative. And I've seen um, stories on the news with individuals who've been tested negative in Liverpool saying they're going to go and visit their, their relatives in old people's homes now they know they haven't got COVID. When we should be telling them you've got a, a reduced risk of COVID and it's only a reduced risk today. Tomorrow it might be different and certainly next week it won't apply. So um, we, I think these technologies are going to be great. I think they have got a role right now in low and middle income countries for diagnosis. That's been defined by WHO. The WHO has a good technical guideline on this. But their role for mass screening is very largely based on modelling where very strong assumptions have been made, which I don't see are justified from any data that we've got. This is in my world of hope rather than my world of fact. Thanks, John. So I think what Don's talking about there is that, that, that reduction in risk and being able to give some degree of reassurance. And we're talking about a, a use case then for testing uh, about allowing people to continue with their, 
uh, with their lives, with their day-to-day -day working practices, and, and, and to give some degree of, uh, of reassurance there. I just wonder whether or not anybody would like to comment specifically when thinking about applying that then to specific groups, such as healthcare workers, or indeed in other settings, uh, as to how that form of testing uh, may or may not al allow people to, um, uh, to, to, to go about the normal uh, business. Uh, and what is it that the science is able to tell us or, or not tell us at this stage? Well, I, I have a uh, Dominic. The, Dominic? Go ahead, Raj. I, I do have a view which is at variance with other people's view, and that's around the issue of immunity. Um, we normally know that immunity to these kind of viruses lasts at least a season, um, sometimes longer. And we were all worried about poor immunity in people with um, COVID-19. But now we have at least 50 million confirmed cases across the world. And the number of reinfections is incredibly low, maybe even less than 10. Okay, maybe we have underestimated even by a thousand, but even if we have underestimated reinfections by a thousand, that's still a very small number of reinfections. So it strikes me that people who definitely have been infected or have had a test that um, indicates that they have had an infection um, they're a bit like Boris Johnson. They're probably bristling with antibodies and the chances of them getting the infection again is very, very slim indeed. And it strikes me that is a group of people we should be trying to mobilize in some way, uh, maybe to do some of the high risk jobs or whatever, because the risk of reinfection in this season, I'm not saying the infection, the immunity will last a lifetime. It might last longer than we think because it, probably a lot of it is T cell um, mediated. Um, but it'll get us through this crisis, this winter crisis we're in, and through the spring. And why are we not using tests for these kind of purposes? I mean, why is the Prime Minister uh, isolating? I can't think of any logical reason. I've got lots of friends who've had it, and they've told me. I was sitting next to one of my friends. He, had a, he said, I had a very heavy dose in March. And I said, but please don't sit so close to me. But as far as he was concerned, he wasn't going to get it again. And I, I do have to agree with him. And um, he's not going to pass it on to me. So I think that's something we all need to discuss a bit more. Thanks, Raj. So I know at the moment through the practice, uh, from my own practice, that uh, contacts of, of confirmed cases are not excluded on the basis of prior infection. I don't, I don't think that that's uh, changing at the moment, but we are seeing obviously a difference in terms of the way that we've been testing from PCR, uh, looking at uh, whether or not somebody has been infected, to thinking about whether or not with um, antigen type tests, uh, people might be considered to be infectious. Uh, and of course, with uh, antibody testing, thinking about immunity uh, and, and, and where that lies as well. Do any of the members of the panel want to just come back on uh, Roger's comments there, just specifically in terms of testing for immunity? Uh, and thinking about that uh, endpoint, uh, how can that be used in a, in a public health sense? Well, my biggest hope is, is oh, sorry, Susan, you go. So I'm gonna have to come in. So I think there is ongoing, very live discussions uh, with multiple immunology and infectious diseases experts. Uh, I would agree with you, Raj. Um, I think that if you've had a prior infection confirmed by PCR, so a highly specific test where really if even all of the ONS survey tests were positive in July, it still gives us a specificity of 99.98%, uh, which is about as good as we're going to get in specificity, I think. Um, uh, we're more likely to have a lab error than uh, anything else there. Um, so from my point of view, I think that there is a live discussion that we should be having. I think it's really important to start that discussion now, because otherwise, what are we going to do when we give a vaccine? Um, uh, are, are we going to expect people who've been vaccinated to be restricted in the same way? I think the important thing is understanding that prior infection is a, probably a bit like lots of other things, a risk reduction measure, but it's not risk elimination. Some people won't develop neutralizing antibodies or have robust T cell responses, and they will be more at risk. Um, but that may be more in, in relation to, to, to individuals and their immune system rather than the population. We don't need everyone in the population to be uh, to have perfect immunity to uh, allow that to start having an effect. Uh, 
But I think the challenge we have at the moment is, and I think the one big challenge, I think my contrary challenge to this is, we don't quite know if even though you don't get the infection again, whether you're able to have enough virus that makes you transmit. Uh, clearly, um, I'm very interested in this and I'm running SIREN, which is a large cohort study. Uh, we've got uh, 28,000 direct recruits and another 12,000 who are in associated um, uh, university or hospital studies where we're sequentially following uh, healthcare workers and as part of their routine PCR testing um, and looking at their antibodies. Um, we'll report that soon, um, but the early evidence says that the majority of people who've got antibodies do fine, but that there, there may be rare um, uh, differences in different people's immune responses. Uh, and I think, you know, it's going to take us time to unpick that, but it's really important to have that live conversation. And also really important, I think, in any population um, testing or any other testing where lateral flow devices are being used in, uh, especially in those that are um, have a low pretest probability that they are confirmed by PCR. Thank you, Susan. Uh, you and you were about to come in a moment ago as well. Yeah, I just want to come back to this very unglamorous uh, part of of all of these businesses, which is just making all of these things work. So very often, I think we focus on you know, what can feel like a rather sort of dry statistical modeling kind of thing about how different numbers would, how in, how an ideal world could work out of deploying these different uh, things. And then that has, that kind of hits this brick wall of how you actually operationalize this inside of different countries. Um, in my role as Deputy Director General of a European institution, I get called on by different countries, some use me more than others, um, and they want all sorts of bits of advice, but actually the most, <laughs> the most practical, important piece of advice is, advice is less strategy and more about how one actually operationalizes higher levels of testing, even testing that is considered to be, in better commas, routine in the UK. I'm sure Susan can attest to the fact that even, even getting very good enough capacity for testing inside of hospitals that will work at the right time in the right place for the right people is, is a very long chain of events. Now, there's nothing um, sexy to discuss in operations. It is, you know, it's just hard, hard work. But what I don't think happens enough is an appreciation of here is a strategy that we want to consider and then a very, very important thing is, can we make this strategy operational? And how long will it take to make it operational? Um, and I think many of the complexities in, in, in COVID response has been due to that gap between strategy and, and uh, operational deployment in this. So it's one of my hobby horses. And, uh, and uh, next, you know, I really hope somebody writes this down and puts it away for pandemic in 20 years time and has this in big bold letters uh, somewhere at the top. Thanks Ewan. So I think under implementation, as you've outlined, there's a lot of challenges. There's logistics, there's, there's uh, policy implementation, there's quality control, there's, there's governance, there's how do we get the sampling and specimen taking right? How do we get the behaviors right? How do we get reporting right? Um, so a, a wealth of challenges there. Now I can see uh, Caroline and Angela both like to come in. So can I take Angela first and then Caroline? just wanted to say that I completely agree and it's been heartbreaking to witness um, the central direction in the UK during the pandemic, certainly in England, um, setting up completely parallel systems instead of allowing our long established, though much decimated, tradition of public health, primary care, hospital based laboratories and national screening programs to actually be the deliverers of well thought through programs. And I mean, probably people overseas who are attending here haven't a clue of just how fragmented this government has caused things to become. Um, and there are reasons to believe that that's deliberate. So we do know how to deliver really good screening programs. And if it was the right thing to do and we had a fantastic test, we could do it really well. Just as Adam has said, we get very high vaccination uptake rates just because the people trust the NHS to do it. 
Thanks, Angela. Uh, Caroline next, and then I think we'll probably take one more question for discussion before we wrap up. Caroline. Thanks, Dominic. And just to add to your list of, of, of issues, I think the clarity of communication, I think, is in, imperative here. Going back to a point that Susan made about the need for uh, confirmatory PCR with a lateral flow test positive results. Um, the notion that, for example, a student will return for a, a, a PCR test once they think they have a negative from a lateral flow test. Um, you know, on, on paper, one can one can see how that might work in, in practice without absolutely crystal clear communications. Um, it, the, the system is, is uh, I think, destined um, to fail. So it's uh, yeah it j just i think the the clar having that real clarity of of um of communication and purpose um around the sort of testing is is super important thanks caroline would anybody like to come back just on uh, caroline's point there or indeed angela's before uh, we move on to a, a final question for the panel no okay so um the last question is going to be a very practical one one of the uh, members of the audience have asked um, that they've got student daughters both based uh, elsewhere in England saying that uh, asking whether or not they should have a COVID test before the end of term, what should she tell them? Uh, conflict of interest in the primary care researcher and teaching on evidence based practice and critical appraisal. So, a very practical and applied question to a very specific setting, but uh, I think you can imagine it being applied elsewhere. And I think it links back to Caroline's uh, point previously about the importance of clear and uh, conclusive communications. Who'd like to start this off? Caroline, you're currently working exactly in that field, so I'm, sure to you first. Um, I'm, I'm happy to provide a response. So the, 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 the expectation is that all students will take up this offer of two lateral flow tests plus a confirmatory PCR test should they um, have a positive result. Um, the the uh, detail um, under the under the hood, if you like, um, means that it can only be offered on a on a um, it can't be offered on a mandatory basis. It's it's got to be offered on on a voluntary basis, um, and um, is is somewhat complicated by the, the pure logistics of testing uh, the requisite number of of students in a very small time frame. So. Um, so the advice I think would be to say, yes, do, please do take up the offer of this test. It will give you um, further insight into your level of risk. Um, it will not tell you whether when you arrive home that you're COVID free, but it will give you some indication as to whether uh, you're likely to be carrying infection home um, uh, or, or diminish the risk of that. I think there are a whole host of behavioral com complexities ar around the decision to actually take the test um, or the, the, the numbers of tests, but I would strongly encourage uh, all students to take advantage of the opportunity. Thank you, Caroline. John? Can I add to that, that um, the test, if it's a lateral flow test, a negative is gonna mean you haven't got a very high viral load right now. So you should travel home that day or in those 24 hours, any later, and it's probably not gonna really be that helpful. But there's also getting this message out that negative tests don't mean you haven't got the virus. And so students perhaps should be told that if they're going home to a house which has got vulnerable or elderly people in, they should also isolate for a week at least before they go home to make sure they minimise their risks. So I think we will have to educate people about risk uh, very strongly in this, that this is about minimising risks. The test is one part of that, but the isolation that they can do beforehand or if they get home, they can spend time doing it when they get home, if their, their home is a safer home. But it, it, it's if so important that we teach people that this is low risk. It doesn't mean you haven't got um, the virus. Margaret, uh, with 30 seconds, please, and then I'll wrap up. Oh, that, that's it's like just a minute. <laughs> so no, just to say, I completely agree with John. I think that the public are capable of taking on nuance here, and we're not giving them that opportunity. I've seen stuff from students that are based that are from universities saying, if you have a negative test, you don't have it. We can do far, far better and treat citizens as adults who can take on subtle and nuanced takes on this. Thank you. So I'd just like to really thank the panel for all the contributions and for the audience as well for the questions that came through. Uh, rather than sort of turning it into Gardner's question time at the end with a practical advice for some of the audience, what I wanted to do was really just bring it home that these are real people that we're talking about. 
uh, the people who are taking the test, there are people who are making decisions about what they need to do with their day-to-day uh, uh, -day living, about whether they should be uh, seeing relatives, what actions they should take, how they should try to uh, take responsibility and, and prevent the risk of infection to other people, uh, which brings us back to that idea right from the beginning. I think, Ewan, as you mentioned, it's not just a paper exercise, it's not just about strategy, it's about real people, it's about balancing risks and harms, it's about getting communication rights, making sure that people understand what those risks are, and ultimately having an endpoint which is about interrupting transmission and making a big difference overall from a public health perspective as well. So there's a role, I think, for epidemiology, there's a role in terms of traditional evaluation, but certainly from what I've heard today, I'd like to hear more about what the science can do in terms of implementation science, the role of health psychology, thinking about behavioral science, and how we can get people to act uh, as a result of the, the testing results that are given as well. So uh, finally, just like to say once again, thank you all very much indeed for your time this afternoon. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed it and I hope the audience has as well. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dominic. That was a fascinating um, discussion and people holding different views, which I liked, and then challenging each other constructively. Uh, our final session, which I think will be just as important, bearing in mind all the things we've heard, is about how we communicate the science. So communication is the final common pathway. Uh, and as Margaret McCartney said, I think the public are available to understand nuanced debates about risk rather than um, simple binary answers. So.